Well, it wasn't so long ago, two, three, maybe four years ago, that women's sport was pottering along, operating in its own small vacuum. It attracted little media coverage, and most events also attracted equally small crowds. But how things have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. A women's football match at Wembley not so long ago attracted over 80,000 spectators. The Women's World Cup final in Australia earlier this year was a sellout in Sydney. And we know here in our own backyard, the Women's Rugby World Cup final at Eden Park attracted a crowd of 40,000. It quite simply has been, I guess, the year of the woman in sport. And so who better to discuss this than two ageing male sports commentators? We also hope to, and I'm sure we will, have a female component in our discussion today as well. But I want to go back into time a bit here. 30 years ago, TVNZ sports commentator and reporter Tony Palmer was asked to make a documentary on Erin Baker, who at the time was by far and away the best female triathlete on the planet. But what Palmer discovered when filming the story was how troubled and disgruntled Baker was with the way the then male-dominated sports media treated sports women, and much the same sort of treatment was handed out by sports bodies. Uh, women treated very much as second-class citizens in, in a lot of areas of sport. It was, if you like, a classic case of ignorance and condescension. Baker, to her everlasting credit, became the voice of disgruntled sportswomen back in those times, calling and demanding change. But it has taken the best part of a generation to turn things meaningfully around. Anyway, Tony Palmer joins me now. Uh, good afternoon, Tony. Let's go back to that time when you were making that story with Erin Baker and the things that she said to you, which really opened your eyes, and see uh, if you can recall the complaints and expand uh, the way she was upset with the treatment she was getting, particularly from male sports administrators. 32 years ago, Chelf. 32 years ago. Wow. <laughs> and Erin Baker, as you well know, uh, was a perfect uh, person to tell this story. And my, I suppose, my concern at the start of it, because back in the day, primetime documentaries uh, were very, very expensive to make. They took quite a while, a few months to, to shoot, and you had to go, you know, different countries and stuff. And she was living in um, uh, Colorado at the time at high altitude and training there. Uh, but she was the perfect person to tell this story simply because of the 121 triathlons she entered in her career, she won 104 of them. Uh, And she usually won by large margins. Uh, She became the first ITU world champion in 1989. Uh, I think that was in Avignon in France. Uh, And she comes from a remarkable family, as anyone in New Zealand who follows sport will know. Uh, this is a, a Catholic family of eight kids growing up in working class Kaiapoi. Uh, not only Erin, but her sister Philippa, the rower, uh, 91 and 94 Helberg Awards, uh, and two other sisters, Kathy and Maureen, both national titles in swimming and aerobics. Um, and she, Erin herself, was named Triathlete of the Decade by the US magazine Triathlete. That was in 1993. Uh, That new year, she got an OBE. Uh, And part of what started her protesting was that she competed in all lengths of triathlon back in the day. There was short course, medium course, and then the Ironman, the the, the big long ones. And what she was annoyed about, having been given all these accolades, was that in the Hawaiian Ironman, the male winner won a brand new car. The women's winner got nothing. And so it really set her off because, of course, she would have been the recipient of a whole bunch of prizes if women were getting what men got, if there was any kind of equality. And she was in a good position to know what men were getting because she was married to Scott Molina, and uh, who also, you know, a top men's triathlete. Uh, And so she's not a person who suffered fools. And if you have a look at her career beyond sport, she's been on the board of the DHB. She's been on the council. She, you know what I mean? She's, she's not a silly woman and she doesn't take, you know, fools gladly. Um, And she had won world champs in short, medium and long term events. Uh, And she also won a New Zealand national championship at 3000, 10,000 meters. So, hardly a frail athlete 
and somebody was in a good position. When I did that documentary, among other things that we had said, a fellow called Bob Harvey, who former mayor of Waitakere and a very political man all his life, involved with the Labour Party, he used to run ad agencies. And when I put to him the question of why is it that Erin Baker is earning very little compared to the men who do the same thing in her sport, and why even against someone like um, Alison Rowe, who won, uh, you know, essentially one high-profile marathon uh, and seemed to be more interested, uh, more interesting to the ad agencies and the big companies sponsoring. And Bob Harvey just sat there and said, oh, well... Erin, you know, she's a mean, tough old dame. And uh, uh, Alison's, you know, she's kind of taller and prettier and blonder. And I just looked at him and, and I was quite stunned, which was unusual doing a television interview because, you know, we'd set aside an hour and a half to talk to him. I didn't need any more. That kind of said everything. The mm. commercial entities <laughs> who were paying sponsorships didn't really want an Erin Baker. Mm. They wanted, and this, this is still the case in women's golf. You get an occasional women's golfer who will come along and may not be the finest, but wears short skirts, looks very pretty, and is quite happy to be photographed. Yeah, they give her a, they give her a microphone and say you can interview these male golfers because they won't turn you down after they've had a round, <laughs> even if it's a bad round they've had. When they see you coming, they'll have a smile on their face and happy to talk to you. And yeah, that's 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 yeah, it but, still, still but, goes uh, on. Erin, she she was she was fabulous talent. She was really good at putting her point of view. She was very concise and very deliberate about what she had to say. She'd given it considerable thought. And it was, you know, in the end, if I say so myself, it's it's the best doco I've made out of 14 or 15. And I thought the best women's sports story around that time. But, you know, we're going back, as I said, 30 odd years. And so what happened uh, end of last year is... Sport New Zealand, the CEO, Raylene Castle, had decided that they launched a campaign which was titled It's Time. It is time. Uh, because we had, obviously, Rugby Union, Rugby League World Cups, we had Fast Five, Netball, we had a Football World Cup coming up. And so this campaign was aimed at promoting greater participation in elite women's sport. Research said awareness uh, is way less and men's, especially in team sports. Only one person in three will watch women's. More than half had no interest in, in changing that. So they wanted more people to know their names and generate interest, whether just on TV or attending events, which would be, you know, a better outcome. Value and visibility was the objective. Value and visibility of the elite. And so you think about that going back before this year, it was a clever idea. It was a very, very uh, concerted campaign. But I don't think anyone would have given them the chance of achieving what they have in, this, in 2022. So to me, the biggest story of sport in 2022 in New Zealand is what various sports have achieved, but mostly in behind uh, a team that has names that we now know, Ruby Tui, Ruahe de Mont, Teresa Fitzpatrick, Stacey Flula, Portia Woodman. You know, these these have become almost household names. And I know from the, the females in my family, they know and they love all those women. Part of what they love is that they look to be exuding joy at the game they play. And they always seem to be, there's, there's no stern, earnest, hard-ass looks they just look like they love what they're doing. And that what that is what makes them entertaining on television. And most of the people who saw them saw them on television. But the fact that they sold out Eden Park to a women's game, the fact that uh, people began to know their names, the fact that they, they rated more than a million on television. That's going back to the 1970s and 80s when there were only a couple of channels, only one channel, uh, and the All Blacks would get that for a Bledisloe. Uh, it was just, you know, and I know, Brendan, that back in the 70s when we started in this game, neither of us would have believed either of those achievable. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I think I think that um, Sport New Zealand deserves a pat on the back, and particularly those, the people who promoted 
the the Black Ferns, you know, in the, in the World Cup. I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree with anything that you have said, but what I'm trying to find out here, what I'm trying to unearth, is what changed things. I mean, yes, they're attractive uh, in, in their personalities and the football or the sport that they're playing, but what what happened? I, and I can't put my finger on it, and I and it's a, it's a worldwide thing because I've cited a huge crowds for cricket in Australia and Oh, look at those, look at those women running through. Look, look at those women running through the boardroom in the European Championship in England. Yeah, and and these massive crowds we've had for football in Europe. But so, yeah. w- what's changed it? What what's caused these? Um, the nearest I can get to it, and it probably sounds a bit self-serving coming from a male voice, is that uh, the quality of sport that women have been playing in recent years has improved um, through basic traditional means good resources, good coaching, money being put into the sport. And I think it's attracted a new audience, both through the turnstiles and in front of the television sets, and it's women. Women who... Oh, numbers, uh, numbers back that up, no, uh, no doubt. I mean, sure, there's always been women, that, you know, some women that have liked rugby and liked a bit of cricket and for one reason or another. But now I think um, there's this quite separate force at work that uh, women are watching sport, playing sport, and um, viewing sport in numbers that were unheard of even maybe four or five years ago. Do you agree? I think, I think yes, absolutely. And I think in the case of the Black Ferns, there are two elements here. Uh, one is pure luck in that they were able to get to the final. They were extremely lucky to beat France. It was one little steal in a line-out. Uh, I think, from memory, Chelsea yep. Bremner. Uh and got them into the final. And then I think I felt throughout that they were always going to be able to beat England simply because of the way they play the nature of the game. And so you end up with a team that plays the most attractive footy winning. I think that was hugely important. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. think that the women, the women and the way they behave is also a very important factor. I, I covered rugby league for years, as you know. Every single year when the final was played and you had Mad Monday, there would be accusations of blokes from various clubs having raped or sexually interfered with or assaulted or got into a punch-up or whatever. In women's sport, as long as I can remember, they don't. No, they, they don't, don't get no. in trouble. They no. don't embarrass the sport. They become charming ambassadors. And if you look at some of the, you know, the names here... They're now being invited onto all sorts of television shows. Then three or four nights a week, you'll see a, a member of that Black Ferns team. Mm. Now, they had some astounding players. Imagine what an all-black team back in the day. You look at, you know, Conrad Smith and um, uh, the, the midfield of the time. Well, how would you go with a Ruby Tui, Ruahe de Mont, Teresa Fitzpatrick? Um, and you've got Stacey Flula, Portia Woodman, um, on, you know, as, as you went, a back line that was just, it was tailor-made for a tournament at home. It was perfect. And the, the other person that I think was a, a substantial um, factor in this is Wayne Smith. We all know, everybody who's followed rugby, male or female, knows that Wayne Smith is respected around the world as a very good brain of tactics and how you play the sport. And I, I loved a quote from him, which I've written down here, I wrote down a couple of weeks ago. When he was being interviewed, you know, towards the end, somebody said to him, how have you got on with these women? You've only ever worked with men. He said, I love these women. They're noisy. Everywhere they're noisy, but they're fun, and they show sheer joy at perfecting their skills. And I just thought, this, this is the same guy who, when he was asked, what are your tactics for this tournament? And he said, our tactics are going to be the same every game. Attack, 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 and then attack. And... Can you imagine an all-black coach saying that? He'd be laughed out of town. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think uh, and, and, he, he found and if, it. So if you, com- if you combine that with earlier this year when the newspaper letters, posters were absolutely awash with hatred and dislike of the all-blacks and the way they were playing and the dull, boring game they were playing and they were losing and they hated the coach and they put him fired, it was... Day after day after day, there were two and three hundred letters in there. And the women kind of came along on the coattail of that. There was already dislike and dissatisfaction with the men's game. 
And I think that the women benefited yeah. to a degree yeah. because yeah. they were simply playing a completely different style that was attractive to watch. So I think what we've come to conclude here is that there's been a number of issues, not one single issue that's been responsible for this, uh, if you like, revolution. And so going back to Erin Baker and her complaints at the time, this huge discrepancy being the obvious one and I suppose the one that really niggled her because she was getting considerably less than her husband when he uh, won a triathlon. Um, nothing much changed, though, did it? Despite her strong co- kind of condemnation of the status quo and calling for change, nothing much happened, though, did it, for, for years? No, that's right. And let's, uh, let's not uh, confuse any of these issues with equality, given that, yes, there's much talk about how much the women have been recognised and the Black Ferns are, are now getting paid, so they, are, they, they can call themselves professional athletes. They're not getting paid what the men are. Women's cricketers aren't getting paid what the men are. The women's golfers aren't getting paid what the men Mm, are. mm. Tennis players, you know, in some cases have reached equality. And so I think what matters most is that you have begun to generate what Sport New Zealand wants. You've got, back in the day when I used to cover a kids show called Small Blacks TV, there were only two All Blacks really in a kid's mind, a nine or 10 year old. There was Dan and Richie. And when Sonny Bill came along, he was, he was kind of on that level as well. Everyone else in the All Black team was irrelevant. If you took kids to go and talk to or watch or whatever, you know what I mean? They need heroes. And so the people who become the stars, as Ruby Tui has done in the Black Ferns, they lift to another level which can influence rather than should or might or we hope will influence kids. Mm. The, um, the other interesting thing here, which is putting, if you like, the ball back in the court of the administrators. One of the arguments that male sports administrators and those that have headed their codes have advanced for years now for why they don't pay women the same amount as men, and I suppose rugby in New Zealand is the classic example. Their argument always was, well, when we have the All Blacks... They don't generate the same yeah, amount of money. When we, yeah. have the, when we put the All Blacks on TV, we get six, 700,000 people. But when we put a women's yeah. rugby match on between New Zealand and Australia, it gets next to no viewers at all. So we can't be paying money to these um, women who are not generating any income. But now that argument is largely, I'm afraid, uh, collapsed, isn't it? Because the women are, are pulling big they're, they're audiences. They're generating the same, aud- yeah, uh, generating both, the same audiences and but, the same attendances. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, if not more. So this is where I'd be really interested to see what happens. Now, OK, I'm not sure what these top... Uh, names now from the women's side are earning. I think I've seen figures of 150 maybe for someone like Ruby Tui uh, or you know one or two others in that team as well. But that's a chicken feed alongside what the you know senior members of the All Blacks get. You know the Sam Keynes yeah. and the Bowden Barretts. So there still is a but, wide gap, isn't but there? Chuck, you, you, but you could you could argue that that that's nothing to do with gender. I mean, you have a look at a game like soccer, which is truly the only worldwide sport, really. Your top echelon, your your absolute superstars, uh, are earning hundreds of thousands per game. Per week, You know what I mean? Hundreds of millions per year. Um, And there are loads of other soccer players who are professionals that don't earn anything like that. No, you're right. Gender isn't important because there are many male sporting events that don't attract a very big audience, and that's reflected in the amount of revenue that those competitors get. Uh, But it's been a very convenient argument that um, sports administrators, rugby, cricket, soccer administrators, have been able to advance up until now. But now, they, yeah, you can take the gender out of it. I mean, if uh, 80,000 people are watching a football match at Wembley, it's a big... uh, national and probably international event and it should be reflected I'm, but I'm not convinced yet that uh, we're seeing anything like equality I think in, in some areas of sport there is some equality I mean for example in tennis with the Grand Slam events um, the prize yes. money breakdown for the men and the singles um, is the same as it is for the women and I imagine the women's doubles is the same as the men's doubles so there is and, and you, could argue, you, argue, you could argue that the women are earning at a higher rate because they play fewer uh, six, don't they? Oh, well, that's an argument which I throw out the window every time I hear it. I mean, um, <laughs> oh, hold on, these blokes are playing five sets, they're only playing three. Well, first of all, very few yeah. men's uh, tennis matches at Grand Slams Run go, to, five, go yeah. to five sets. Um, yeah. Most yeah. of them are over in three, and a lot of the women's 
sets are over in three, so it's a silly argument in, in that sense, and no, it's historical I'm, anyway. I'm, just, suggest- yeah. I'm yeah. just suggesting that that's what the counter-argument would be. Yeah. But another thing that it's worth looking at historically is, you remember when, when you and I were relatively new sports guys, you know, working in a sports department, the people who ran New Zealand rugby didn't give a tuppenny toss if it was entertaining or not. They didn't feel that was their duty at all. Yeah. They would look you in the eye and go, it's about winning. It's not about how attractive it is to watch. Whereas as soon as it became professional and now professional sport around the world, it is important. It matters mm. a hell of a lot um, how attractive it is to watch. Uh, now, OK, just before we finish, one thing we haven't touched on here, which we should, is the role of media and all of this. You and I, again, just thinking yes. back to when uh, we began in this business all those decades ago, um, trying to find a female commentator or a female sports reporter uh, was almost impossible. Again, because yes. historically they had um, unfortunately been kind of suppressed, if, if it's not too strong a term, rather like female sportswomen had had. I mean, I remember a couple of Jane Dent, who's still a very good friend of mine. I, I, she was probably the first one. Uh, Kathy Campbell, yep. the late Kathy Campbell, sadly no longer yep. with us. But there were very few women now. And most, most, of that, most of that started, Brendan, when Julie Christie became the head of sport. At TVNZ and was keen to have women reporting because she knew it had been, you know, uh, an odd thing for quite a period of time. Um, but it's quite interesting when you have a look back also, I did a wee bit of research on this, and you start having a look at what male journos, particularly print journos, were actually covering women's sport, uh, stories, women's sport, were supporting women's sport. And a couple of names come up, Joseph Romanus and Ron Polensky. Both did a fair amount of that. You and I both did a fair amount of that. We know Keith Quinn, our colleague, was one of many who tried hard, who who cared about women's sport, who took an interest in it, who would report it. But you're right, there were so few women Mm. and the men's sports departments in newsrooms around the country were just full of arrogant men. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's changed, thankfully. Um, and yeah. f- f- for the better, but so the media, which so it's easy for us, I suppose, to pass opinion on sports administrators. But our own industry was v- was very much part of the same network of um, keeping women's sport, you know, right down there. No, uh, Charles, it wasn't just keeping it wasn't just keeping women's sport. It was women in general. If you remember in those days, uh, patting backsides and commenting on the size of breasts was something that men did a lot. And in my memory, men who were bosses did a lot. They would say things that these days you'd be fired for, or you would be expected well, to resign. It still for. happens quite doesn't it? I mean, hardly a day goes by where you don't find there's a, someone up at the employment tribunal court or in a court yep. of law uh, being sued for a boss for their condescending and kind of offensive attitude towards women on their staff. But um, and so, so that's that's one of the things that has happened. I think that that as a result of that, there is a little more care and and a little more uh, respect from men in general, yeah. and particularly men who employ women. Anyway, Tony, I think we might leave it there. We've uh, hopefully uncovered a lot in, uh, over the last 30 years, and uh, <laughs> we'll see if we can get some female perspective on all of this. I imagine they probably still have some issues with some of the things that we've been talking about this morning but, or this afternoon. But anyway, I thank you very much indeed for your time. Much appreciated. And uh, you and all of the women in your life, I hope you have a very happy and enjoyable Christmas. Good on you, mate. Happy Christmas.